Hi everyone and welcome to my show today, a spontaneous show. We wanted to, um, I wanted to bring on my friend Michael Neal and I just wanted to um, yeah, share him with my audience and also I'm going to tell you a little bit about an event that we're doing at the end of this week in LA but we'll get to that much later. We just want to share some fun stuff with you in the interim. Hey Michael, how are hello, you doing? Hello. I am very well, nice to be here. It's it's great to have you here. Um, so usually when Michael and I get together, we have some really fun conversations. And I just today, want to... Today, though, we're not going to. Oh, so. we're not, right? Not no. today. <laughs> no, no, no. We're saving that for the weekend. So today we're going to be really serious. Yeah, it's not. we're not going to pull it off, but it was worth a try. Okay, I'm done already. Let's okay, just you're... The conversation. <laughs> you're done being serious. I, I know, that, that was that enough. That was enough. That was kind of tiring, actually. It was. <laughs> See... Um, so tell me, so Michael, so anyway, um, the, our, actually, I wanted to ask you about the get out of jail free card. So I use that term and I use, I've used it a couple of times, my get out of jail free card, um, or, if, or it felt like I got a jet, get out of jail free card for life. When I used it, I just wanted to ask you, what did you, you know, because it seemed like with you, what I was really pleased with or happy with in that moment, you loved that term and you played off of it. So I wanted to play off of that right now with you and well, maybe yeah. even just give the audience a little bit about your understanding of it when I use that term. So you can correct me. <laughs> well, I think what Anita <laughs> really meant was. Uh, no, <laughs> what, what, I, what, what was so striking about it, so we were on stage doing the Experiencing God event and you were talking about that kind of getting a get out of jail free card for your life. And the image is a kid who grew up playing Monopoly. It was like, oh yeah, it was always cool when you had to get a jail free card because then you didn't have to worry about anything because if anything bad happened, you just played your get out of jail free card. And somebody in the audience said, well, wh what exactly is the get out of jail free card? And you said, oh, just be yourself. And you said it as though we would all go, oh, and then get on with our lives with a sense of utter freedom and possibility from that moment on. Actually, I remember the entire room freaking out and going, be yourself? Who am I? I don't know who I am. How can I be myself? So, I mean, that might be actually a pretty good place to start. Is What does it mean to you to be yourself? Okay, so that's a great place to start. It's a really great place to start. So, so let me start by saying, um, who have you become uh, today? Like, um, so if I ask myself, let's take the person I was before I had the near-death experience. If I am to reverse engineer it and look back to that person I was, that person I was was not the real me. That person was built up from all the voices that I could hear. So when you speak to yourself, what is the voice that you are using on yourself? And chances are, most people will say, oh, it's that voice that says, uh, that, that, that says, oh, don't be crazy, don't be silly, you're not good enough for this. Um, and the voice that's always feeling fear of shame, fear of not being good enough, fear of not fitting in, and, and don't take this risk, and uh, you'd be crazy to do this, and how can you do that? And, um, you know, it's that voice that's constantly telling you to be careful. And so I would ask people, and, and nearly everybody has, has that voice. I mean, what about you, Michael? Do you have that voice inside? Like, oh, I've got many of them. <laughs> I, I mean, better. you know, when I read the definition of schizophrenia, I was like, oh, that's me. Yeah, I, I hear voices and see pictures in my head and can't always tell which ones are real and which ones are just happening inside my head. So, yeah. And what are these voices doing and saying to you? Are they preventing you from really living your life fully and having, um, you know, do they prevent you from ex having positive experiences in life? Well, they did until I saw them for what they were. So, I mean, the way I think about it is you're, you're, you're not the voices inside your head. You're the one hearing voices inside your head. That's right. And, and once, you, once I saw that, then it, it stopped really mattering what the voices were saying. Yeah. Because I stopped listening. Yeah. See, and that's the thing. That's when you get to be yourself, when you stop listening. So I realized, for example, for me, what I can identify, the voices came from 
a lifetime, and I believe it's probably the case for a, a lot of people, uh, of just your life experiences. So for example, I was bullied as a child. And so when you're bullied as a child, you have this, I, at least for me, I developed this kind of victim mentality. And so I was bullied because of my, um, you know, I was a different skin color from the people around me. And I was this brown girl and I was in a, in a school predominantly with white kids. And so I was bullied. I looked different. I had frizzier hair, um, darker skin than them and so on. So, um, so, for, so the voice in my head m convinced me that I am inferior to certain types of people because, because of that experience. So let's say, for example, I'm standing in line in a, at an airport, a security line, and let's say a couple of people are being randomly picked for a secondary check. You know, it's just a random secondary check, uh, you know, search, and it, let's say I'm one of the people picked. Immediately, the voice in my head will say, oh, that's because you're a different race from everybody else. It's, it's racial profiling because that was what was conditioned in me as a, as a kid. But what if that's not true? What if that voice is actually lying to you? And so that is what, to me, prevents you from being yourself. And that's why I tend to ask people when they're stuck, when they don't know how to be themselves, or who am I? What does it mean to be yourself? I start asking them, okay, so what are those voices in your head telling you? And so we start to identify that. That's usually the place I usually start. Is, are those voices telling you that you're not good enough and you've got to play small and do those voices? Um, here's another one, another example uh, for me, is that as a woman who grew up in a culture where um, there was a tremendous amount of gender disparity. Mm -hmm. And so I was rewarded for being subservient. So the more that, um, so women are basically valued uh, or judged by how valuable they are to the men in their lives. That's, that's their worth. They're, they're, they're only worth as much as they are valued by the men in their lives. And so I was always um, rewarded by, for making myself valuable to the men or to, of being, for being of service to the men around me. So then as an adult, um, I don't want to be, you know, I, I have ideas, I want to get out in the world, I want to uh, influence people, I want to do things. Um, and suddenly, but there's this voice inside that you can't do that because people will judge you. There's this, I'm judging myself, it's that voice judging me. You're a woman, um, you're an Indian woman, and people are not going to like you, you're not going to be desirable to men. And that's what prevents you from being who you are. And it's like, you're never going to get married if you do that. And men are going to uh, find it too, um, that you're too forward. And, and all this stuff that we've been conditioned. So that's the kind of thing that prevents a lot of people from being who they are. And well, let then, me, mm -hmm, let me go ahead. Just on that, because I've actually noticed that the opposite is also true. So as often as not, the, the voices inside people's head go, oh, no, no, you're different. You're special. You're, you're better than that. You're, you, you know, you, they're, they're just, boy, everyone else is stupid. If only, and, and it, so we, we think that's positive, right? That's self-esteem. I can see how much better I am than everybody else. But that's, that's just the same game. Yes. Reverse. It's almost like the voice, the, the, you know, I don't think it's really got this kind of diabolical will, but it's almost like it's going, all right, they're not going to buy the less than, but I can get them on greater than. And, and it's that same thing is you then have to live up to this idealized self that you've created in your own head. So then it's stressful because I'm supposed to be the kind of person who's responsible and I'm supposed to be the kind of person who's successful and I'm supposed to be the kind of person who can solve problems and brings a can-do attitude to things. And I'm supposed to be the kind of person who. Yeah. And it's really that phrase. That, that phrase is the dead giveaway that, that you're not listening to your true self. Yes, the I'm supposed to. It's the yeah, I the should, I'm person, the and I'm supposed to. Who the you, you, you know, but people like me, right? All of those are like little clues that, no matter how positive or negative that is, it's not a patch on who we really are. Exactly. We're all of it. 
where where are all of it? Where the the tiny and where the huge? Where the the very very human, which generally involves being a little bit neurotic and insecure, but yes. we're also the God. We're also the the that which is connected to all of life. Yes. And exactly. both things are true. Both things are, tr are true at the same time. Yeah. And, and, and that is so true because even that voice is the false voice that I am superior to everyone else or I'm not supposed to have these kinds of problems. Yeah. And other, these are other people's problems. And, and I'll tell you, people who work in our, in our field doing the work we do, we are the most susceptible to fall into that from the perspective that, um, but, but I'm the one who teaches this, so how can this happen to me? You know, yeah. and so we did judge ourselves. The, did you ever learn the thing? Did they ever, like when you were learning about public speaking, did they ever do the thing, imagine yourself 50 feet tall, towering over the audience? Do you ever get that kind I, of coaching? I didn't get that, well, no. that's a big like public that. speaking coaching thing, is, oh. is you imagine yourself as huge and the audience is tiny, and you're just toying with them with your paws, with your cat's paws. And, and the, again, the problem with it is, yeah, it does help people overcome their nerves, but it totally disconnects them from the audience. Yes, it does. You're right about that. The one I got, which I still remember Cheryl Richardson taught me because it was the first time I was stepping on stage in front of an audience of 3,000. Wayne was calling me up on stage and it was before the event started <clears throat> and I was talking to Cheryl Richardson because, you know, it's one of these multi-speaker yeah. events. And she was, and she took me aside. She, was, she said to me, so I said, I'm so nervous. And she said, I want you to just focus your eyes on one person somewhere in the middle of the audience. The whole audience will feel you're looking, looking at them. But just focus on one, even if you have to shift to another one, but speak to one person at a time. And imagine that one person really needs to hear your message. And that was the best advice ever. She said, imagine that they are going through what you went through to get you to where you are now and I, speak I worked, to them. I mm -hmm. worked with a, with a coach in the, in the United Kingdom and, and he was Princess Diana's speaking coach. And he said the thing that, and he wound up writing a book about it, the thing that made the difference to her was when he would just say, just, just talk to me, just talk to me. Just don't forget, just talk to me. Wow. And it was that. It's like then we get out of all those voices yeah. and we just talk to somebody. And that's the whole, one of the reasons we so enjoy being with people is it gets us out of our own head. It does. In an ideal world, sometimes it gets yes. us more into our heads. But, yes. you know, but it does get us out of our head. And I, and I really believe that even the advice that Cheryl gave me was like the best advice because all I do is I go into that space that what would I want to know if I was in that position, if I was... They're struggling with whatever, struggling with the illness, struggling with lack of self-esteem, lack of self-worth. What would I want to know? Speak to that one person. And, and, I, and that's what I do. I feel, gosh, this is what I would want them to know. And I think the two pieces of advice I was given was picture the audience naked and make sure that you are not naked. The, I've the, heard the, that the one. Two, you know. I've heard that one. Yeah, it's not really great advice, kids. Don't try this at home. But you know, <laughs> don't try it on live video. <laughs> and 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 so you know, so for me, the the get out of jail free card was when I was in that NDE state. All those voices were gone, and that's the first time when I realized that those voices were not actually me, like what they were saying did not reflect what I can and can't do, should or shouldn't do. None of that existed. It was like it was a clean slate and I could do whatever I wanted and it was okay. So, so whether it's the voice of inflation, like I'm too good for this, I'm really, um, I, I shouldn't be in this situation, or whether it's the voice of who do you think you are, or it's, it's because you're, um, you know, you're, you're too small to be this way, or it's, uh, so whichever voice it was, None of those voices are true. Those are coming from something within our own insecurities, our own past, our own conditioning. And so that blank, no voices, it's like, oh, wow, so what is it I'm feeling? And that's when it just felt like there was this space of, 
um, that's the space I called unconditional love, where for the first time I just experienced who I was. That was my get out of jail free card. One of the, my favorite descriptions of that voice, it comes from a, a Zen teacher named Sherry Huber. And she wrote in one of her books, that voice inside your head is not the voice of God. It yeah. just sounds like it thinks it is. That's it. It's not the voice of God. And a lot of people mistake it for the voice of God or whatever we want to call yeah, it, the, the voice divine. Of the, truth or, or, the voice of the truth, the universe, the divine, your higher self, your guides. So, and the interesting thing is the guidance or the voice of truth or God or divine, um, you can't hear it. It can't get through when those other voices are too strong. That's what that's the other thing I, I felt, at least for me, in, in, when I was in the near-death experience. It's like, oh, there is actually a kind of guidance that's coming through, but it couldn't get through because of those other voices. They were too loud. Well, and, you know, that's why I often talked about as the still, small voice within. Yeah. But I, yeah, I did have a, a, a German client once ask me, why, why is the voice still small? And it's like, no, 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 not like that. It's still, it's quiet. Yes. And it's small because it's just very clear. There's no drama. There's no righteousness. There's no flag waving and, you know, you need to believe in yourself. It, it's just, I don't even, I don't have a word for it, but it's just it's, truth. That's it. It's just truth. It's just truth. And there's no judgment in that voice whatsoever. There's nothing. It's just truth. But it's very comforting. And the word I attach to it is, is love because there isn't another word. Um, yeah. Would you like to take some questions from yeah, our... Let's so, so let's first... Uh, so, so anybody tuning in, if you have any questions for Michael and me on the subject we're talking about or other subjects, anything at all. If you've even worked out what the subject we're talking about is. <laughs> I know. <laughs> and we can go in so many different directions. Um, so, and I think what we're really going to be yeah, talking about this weekend is about how to be yourself and what does it mean to be yourself. And, uh, and, but, but, and, and, and also the, sort of the title of it, Finding Freedom, is, is to really see what freedom is and what it isn't. Because for me, at least, freedom... As I was growing up, I was kind of taught, well, freedom is to be able to do whatever you want, whenever you want, with whoever you want. And that, that doesn't ring true to me. That, that doesn't, that's not really a recipe for a great life. The freedom that, that I think that Anita and I are both pointing to in our own ways is, is a kind of a freedom of mind. Yeah. It's an inner freedom, which will give you more of a sense of freedom on the outside. But it's a kind of freedom you can have regardless. Sometimes our freedom of movement is restricted. I teach in prisons, and one of the things that pretty much every time I've ever gone in, someone has said is, who knew I would have to come to prison to learn to be free? It's not to do with our circumstances. It, it, it is to do with a sort of a deeper seeing of who we are and who we're not. That's very beautiful, and I loved that. And who knew I would have to come to prison to to find my freedom, to be free. That's very powerful. Yeah, so, it's just, yeah. <laughs> it makes me feel about this big when I think, it's really hard for me. <laughs> not, I know. It really isn't. <laughs> no. So let's go into a couple of questions. I see, I see Danny beckoning me. We've got some queued up, which is great. We love questions. Ooh. So, ah. Lucia Mitro, I remember you. What is the difference between voices and intuition or voice of God? So, so we've sort of touched on it, but Michael, would you like to add no, anything no. else? I think, you know, I sometimes say that when people first even realize that there is a difference, it, it, trying to tell the difference between the two is like trying to tell the difference between two blades of grass. When you really start to get a feel for it, it's like trying to tell the difference between a blade of grass and a lawnmower. They're, they're nothing alike. But at first, because it's kind of conceptual, it sounds like, well, how do I know? Which we... My own experience is that the, that sense of inner knowing that Anita's calling love, I, I, I sometimes call spaciousness or stillness or peace, or it, it comes with a feeling. 
It's a feeling of clarity. It is a feeling of quiet. It's a feeling of stillness. It's a feeling of obviousness, but not obviousness like, duh, just like, oh, oh, of course. And, and you start to listen for a feeling and, and that it doesn't matter then if you're hearing voices. Yeah. It's the feeling. It's the feeling. So that's great. And for me, the difference is that when I feel, when I can hear the voice of God or the universe or the divine, there's a feeling of, oh. It's like a comfort feeling. When it's my own voice, it creates more stress in my body. It's like, oh, is this what I have to do? Oh, is it? It literally, uh, it's like tightening uh, guitar strings. And my own voice, I mean, when I say my own voice, I'm, the voices that we're talking, the voices of, uh, that, that are not our higher self, and those voices feel like you're tightening the guitar strings tighter and tighter. When it's the voice of the divine or my higher self or the universe, it's like somebody's loosened it and you're like, oh. And it's when you least expect it, like when you're in the shower or in the bathroom, that's, that's when you can hear it or just before you go to sleep because it's the space between your thoughts, the space between when that other voice is bombarding you with fears and doubts and all. Now. What no. may, mm -hmm. go ahead. Sorry. Well, I was just going to share a quick story. I, I remember at one point I went through a stage where I was working with two different coaches. One who was a traditional sort of Tony Robbins, go get him tiger kind of a coach. And one who was a, basically a spiritual teacher. And I would come away. F I, I remember asking the spiritual teacher coach, why is it that when I go to my empowerment coach, I come away feeling ready to take on the world. And when I come away from my sessions with you, I'm kind of like, eh. And, and, and he laughed and he just said, I don't think that feeling of ready to take on the world means what you think it means. And over time, I came to really see, oh, that I'm ready, I'm pumped is actually so stressful. There's so much tension in it. There's so much not enoughness in it. There's so much striving in it, even though it's hopeful striving. Whereas that feeling that I was describing as eh was a precursor to peace. That if I was willing to sit in the eh for even a minute, it was ah. And in that ah space, that's when the voice comes through. As I said, whether you hear it as a voice or you just somehow know what to do. That's, that's really beautiful and it's a great it's a great distinction because even as you were talking and you were saying, talking about the, the pumped up coach and you coming away saying, I'm ready to take on the world. I myself was feeling myself getting higher, strung as you were saying. It's like, <laughs> and so I completely get it. And a lot of typical conventional, traditional style coaching is that style, that ready to take on the world. And the thing is, that's actually a little bit of an oxymoron because when you're at peace, you don't even feel you need to take on the world. There's nothing to take on. It's all you. It's, it's you know, the world's there, inside. <laughs> the world, there, there is no world to take on. <laughs> no. It's like, I'm going to take on my stomach. I, I don't think you need to do that. I mean, you know, <laughs> yeah, good. the whole world is within you. There's yeah. nothing to take on. And that's actually the point. And, you know, and I, I also know that I'm, I'm aware that I speak to a lot of people who deal with physical illnesses and scary diagnosis. So when you get a scary diagnosis, that scary diagnosis, and then the voice kicks in and, or all your voices kick in and say, oh my God, this is a death sentence. You're going to die. You got to do this. You're gonna... Those are the voices that are not the voices of divine. The voices of the divine is the one that feels like when you turn inward, when you meditate, when you give, when you hand everything over, uh, when you surrender, it's that voice that goes, that sort of the feeling is, I got you. No matter what happens, it's okay. It's okay. And many people going through illnesses go through little phases of feeling that peace. But then as soon as, in some cases, um, not trying to throw doctors under the bus, but in many cases it is the case, after they've been to the doctor and the doctor then reinforces how scary the diagnosis is and talks to them about prognosis, that peace feeling is gone. It's again replaced with those scary voices saying, oh my God, this is what you have to do. If you don't do this, this is good. And you're back into that. 
which is one of the things that I constantly talk about is that when doctors do that, when they take you out of that peaceful space and put you back into that scary place, they're doing you a disservice. So if you're a doctor and you're listening in, um, you actually, people, patients um, need to be in that peaceful place for maximum healing. So, Which, by the way, it. doesn't mean lying. Which, it, either way, doesn't, sorry, doesn't say again. It doesn't mean lying. It doesn't mean, oh, yes. it's going to be fine. No, it doesn't mean lying. It isn't always going to be fine. But there's a difference between pointing out possibilities yes. and delivering death sentences. That's it. Pointing out possibilities and letting the patient know that you're with them every step of the way. And, and that I'm going to travel the journey with you. Whatever you choose, I'm going to travel it with you and support you, support your choices. You know, there are ways of doing it. Um, yeah, I remember but, writing in one of my books, uh, that specifically the question that was just asked about, you know, how do you tell the difference between the, the voice of God and the, the, the voice of the should? And, and the way I put it was the still small voice within doesn't think you suck. Yes. It's kind of that simple. <laughs> it's that simple. It's that simple. The still small voice doesn't think you suck. The still small voice has got your back. They've got you. They've got you. They're not going to say anything that, that tightens your strings or, or makes you more stressed or, or causes you to fall down or break down. Yeah, because what, what, what I've found for myself, for the people that I work with, is it's more likely, it isn't always, it's fine, it's fine, it's going to turn out fine. It's, you're okay, and you'll handle it fine. Yeah. And, and sometimes it will also be fine, and sometimes you'll just handle a difficult circumstance with a lot more grace than you imagined was possible. Yes, exactly, and that's, and that's it. Um, and that's the still small, it reminds me of something someone said this weekend, and I can't, you know, I mean, he, he used an expletive, and I'm not going to use the expletive, but it was just really funny. I'll use, Some, I'll use the expletives over the weekend, though, if you come, <laughs> I promise I will use expletives. Oh, cool. I think, yeah. I think more people will want to come now after hearing that. And, and so this last weekend, there was this guy, somebody asked him, um, someone said to him, so how's life? And he goes, life is great. I'm all effed up, but life is great. And I thought that was pretty good. Yeah, and 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 it's almost like, you know, we're we're kind of pointing to the possibility of the opposite. Sometimes life might suck, but you're great. <laughs> That's the better way around. Yeah. You know? And every now and again, life's great and you're great. That's cool too. Yeah. And at other times, life's great, but you're not. Yeah, and and it's all. You know, for me, there's a difference between freedom and false positivity. So freedom means the freedom to be not great when you're not great. Yeah, and to allow that. To be scared when you're scared. Yeah, and to really not yeah. judge that because we've become a society or, or a paradigm or a culture that doesn't allow ourselves to feel to feel fear, to feel not great. We don't allow it. We, we feel inadequate in some way. I, I went on a course, so I, you know, for those of you that don't know, I was a depressed suicidal teen and dealt with that and the aftermath of that for many years. And I went on a, on a happiness course uh, at, in the 90s. And I came home and my wife, Nina, asked me, well, what did you learn? And I thought about it and I went, you know what I learned? I learned that it's okay to not be happy. And I felt so much better because I hadn't realized that in my world, I was supposed to be happy 24 seven. And if not, there was a problem. And, and it was like, oh, that's not a problem. Sometimes I feel stuff. <laughs> like it was revelatory yes. to me. It's almost like, like sometimes it rains. Well, what happens when it rains? I get wet. Oh my God. No, because <laughs> I'm going to dry out again. Like yes. that's how we work. It's okay to get wet. It's yes. okay to not always feel great because we will return to ourselves. We'll come back to ourselves. And again, that's another version of the get out of jail free card is we will always come back to ourselves. We will always come back home. We will always return to original grace. And, and knowing that 
means we don't have to worry about it so much when we're not feeling it. Yeah. Wow. That's very, yeah. That, and it's, it's really interesting because um, I lived a life of fear, like really, really filled with fear, but I judged the fear. And so I was fighting the fear. And so I started fearing the fear. And it was only after the near-death experience did I realize that I didn't have to fear the fear. And when you don't fear the fear, it dissipates. It's when you fear it that you're actually prolonging it because, because now you're dealing with the fear of the fear. And so when you're dealing with the fear of the fear, so you've added another layer to it. But the minute you accept that I feel fear and it's part of life. And, uh, and, so, and so what started to happen is that once I accepted that fear is okay, it's part of life and I don't judge myself, the fear just started to dissipate. And so I always tell people that even though it's better not to be in fear, don't fear the fear. It's, it'll dissipate once we well, embrace it. I sometimes talk about it in terms of more full stops, more periods, less commas. Yes. That if, if it's like, I'm scared, cool, like that happens. I'm scared, comma, and I shouldn't be scared. And if I'm this scared now, imagine how scared I'm going to be in the future. And I'd be better if I wasn't scared. And if I was a real man, if I was a, you know, a wise woman, if I was this, if I was that, then I would. And it gets more and more crazy in here when actually the full stop, I'm scared, not a problem. And yeah. there's a real freedom in that. More full stops, less commas. Yeah. So now I want to um, say something that could be seen as somewhat provocative. But do you think that a lot of people uh, of our genre who do the work we do that constantly give the impression that life has to be a certain way and give the impression that their lives are amazing. Do you think that they're doing a disservice to people and in fact creating a culture of people who feel like they are, um, that they're failing because their lives are not like that. And so they're constantly trying to strive to follow all these, the, the teachers, oh, the self-help teachers. You know, and the, I'll, I'll share a very particular story, obviously, without mentioning names. There was a, um, I'd sort of seen through it up to a point myself. I kind of met enough people to who do the kind of work that we do to know they're all human. You know, yes. the, the best of them is pretty human. And, and it was, there was this one guru though, who I'd met and had a lot of respect for. And I, I started following them on Facebook and I started really questioning myself because their life was so good. And, and I mean, mine, I like my life, but it wasn't like theirs. And I, and I really started to doubt everything that I had seen about freedom and, and that actually we're better off having a life and not a one-sided life. And, and then I got uh, an email from them saying that they were suicidal and could I help them? Oh, wow. And it turned out that the whole Facebook thing was them trying to fake it till they make it, trying to... Uh, it, genuinely positively intended, trying to, that if I keep saying that it's going well, maybe at some point it will. But it was a double disservice. It was a disservice to everybody like me. Who yes. I, the voice in my head said I should know better, right? But who really thought, oh, maybe it is possible to have that kind of perfect, shiny life for an extended period of time. But also for themselves, because they they were never able to just be with life as it was for them in the moment. And the irony being, when we get quiet and present to life as it is, it somehow becomes okay. And we don't need to change it. We don't need to make it better. Yes. Yes. See, I knew you could articulate that very well, because this is a conversation that I have been feeling that is very important to have. And, and um, you know, and I really want people to get this because there is a downside with too much of the following gurus and self-help teachers and the constant um, feeling that they need we need to be better do more be more and there there is really a downside because a lot of the people teaching it are giving you tools and needing to keep that facade of an amazing life and 
And so it is important for people to know that they deal with the same problems you do. They deal with insecurities. I, I say they, we. We is probably a more truthful reflection. You know, we deal, uh, I still walk into a room sometimes and, and feel that, oh, um, I wonder if anybody's going to talk to me. I wonder if, if I go join that table or talk to those people, are they going to think, oh, who does she think she is and why she interfered in our conversation? Or, or, and I worry that if I go over to this table, are people going to say, oh, these seats are reserved for someone else? And so, you know, we all go through this same stuff. And, and I think it's important for people who, um, I think it's important for people who do this work to say that, that it never goes away, not completely, but at the same time, it's still possible to find freedom, love, joy in your life by knowing that this is part of life. This is part of being normal. This is just how it is. I remember once um, hearing a, a, a coach say that his favorite phrase was in spite of, as opposed to because of. Because, so, you know, people go, well, I'm great because of this, or I'm terrible because of that. And, and, and his point of view was, look, you can be free in spite of anything. There doesn't have to be a cause that because of this. Yeah. It, look, in spite of the fact that from time to time I get really wound up, I, I do spend a lot of time in peace. In spite of the fact that my circumstances are not always what I would like them to be, I have an amazing life. In spite of the fact that I have amazing circumstances, sometimes I don't like my life. Like there's a lot of freedom in the phrase in spite of. There is, you know, because, yeah, because there are times when I don't like my life, when, when yeah, it's, there are times I get overwhelmed, and yes, there's a lot of freedom. But in spite of that, I feel free, I feel happy. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Cool, let's go to some more questions. Do we have any more? Um, Danny's going to punch one more up. Okay, I like this bit. Yeah, I love getting cool the questions. On the screen. Yeah. And oh, I've set Danny up though. Yeah, yeah see? <laughs> you set him up and now now it ain't happening. <laughs> In the meantime, I'm I'm feeling like my whiteboard is is way too white compared to It others. is. Like, you, need to, yeah, you, you need Yeah, you need Yeah. Put it put in a picture or something. Yeah. No, it, yeah. Danny, put, Danny thought I should write the word cheese everywhere. Like you've got love. I would have cheese. I, I don't know why. <laughs> or wine. <laughs> yeah, well, no. If I did cheese, you could do wine and we could get together. It would be beautiful. That would be perfect. <laughs> well, let me ask, while, while, while we're waiting for, for, um, for Danny, for you, so we, we spent a lot of time together putting together Experience in God, and now it's sort of a year on that we're, we're playing with the, the Finding Freedom program. What have you seen in the last year in this area like what's opened up for you because obviously you had your experience but the ramifications of that have continued to unfold what's new like what do you so see fresh? the ramifications of it um they they absolutely continue to unfold and it still surprises me how much still continues to unfold and pour out and um it's it's like um a lot of things are new. So I went through a period of feeling like um, I was, I went through a period of feeling like, oh, everything's amazing. Everything's amazing. I'm getting all these opportunities thrown my way. It feels fantastic. And so I was saying yes to all these different opportunities and thinking, oh, you know, I, you know, that sort of feeling that, that, oh, I've arrived now. And, and so it's all happening. But what I realized, so the next thing that happened after that was I started to feel incredibly overwhelmed, like really overwhelmed and thinking, what have I done? Why have I said yes to this? Why have I taken on this project and that? And feeling this heavy sense of um, responsibility to fulfill everything I had said yes to. And I started to feel the same. So, so on the one hand, you kind of feel, oh, I've arrived, this is it, everything's happening. But then the, the flip side was when I started in that excitement, it was almost like childlike, oh my God, look at this, it's like a kid in a candy store. 
And then it's like, oh God, I got to fulfill this. And I, I don't have any time. I can't, I don't have time to, to, to do my chores and I've got to create content for this event and that. And, and it became so heavy that I started to feel drained and tired. And um, I realized I was, I was, I found myself in the reverse of my old problem of never being able to say no and getting drained because I was doing a whole bunch of things that I didn't want to do, you know, which caused the cancer in the beginning. Now I was again feeling, I, I started to feel like I was in that same space of, oh my God, my body feels so drained. If I don't do something, I'm going to get sick again. And so that was again another big lesson for me. It's that even when opportunities are coming at you, you have to be so certain that you are in that space of connection with the divine or whatever, to know that even if you're turning down the greatest opportunities, that if they're meant for you, they're going to come again when you're ready for them. Yeah. So yeah, it was, it was really... Many mm. times in my career where if I'd gotten what I thought I wanted, I don't think I would have been able to handle it. And many of the opportunities did come back around at a time where it was no big deal for me. Yeah, yeah. that's exactly it. Because um, it's exactly that where I really had to be unafraid to even say no to amazing opportunities just because I was feeling overwhelmed. You know, it's like, just say no, because if it's meant to be yours, it'll come back. And this is the time to prove that to yourself, that you're in the space where it's going to be <clears throat> it's going to be normal but yet i wasn't feeling it yet i was still feeling oh, how can i let that go but no and so it was a big it felt like a huge uh, that i was calling to step up and start saying no even to things that i would have jumped at maybe a year or two years ago so that was a big lesson so here's a here's a question from Cheryl Linda Taylor what's the best way to heal I wish you were in front of me because I would ask you uh, questions like, you know, a little more specific. <clears throat> but the best way to heal, in a nutshell, is to get your mind out of your way. Um, so, so the best way to heal. So a lot of people ask me the question of um, why did I experience in the healing and why isn't it available to everybody? So I'm going to give you my opinion of what I feel happened and why it isn't, uh, why people feel it isn't available to everyone. I actually believe it is available to everyone. Um, when I healed, it was not that the near-death experience healed my body. The near-death experience actually got me into a state of being where the mind was gone, the doubts were gone, the fears were gone, all of that was gone. And in that state of being, I was able to see without any doubts, without any second thoughts, without anything, that there was a purpose that lay ahead of me. And so the focus became about the purpose. So when I came out of the coma, my body was still extremely sick, extremely sick. It didn't just heal the second I came out of the coma. But the second I came out of the coma, the focus was on the elation of the fact that oh, I have some clarity, I have a purpose, I have a reason for living. That was the focus. It was that focus with all the fear gone that allowed my body to heal because my body, my mind was no longer saying that oh my God, I got cancer. Oh my God, this is spreading. Oh my gosh, I'm going to die. Oh my gosh, um, this is terminal. My mind was no longer destroying me by saying that. So here's the, the other piece I just want to add to it. When I was healing, because of the frame of mind I was in, um, I was able to hold that space th that this is um, this is my purpose. I have to go in this direction, but the whole time, um, 
I was dealing with skeptics. I was dealing with doctors who wouldn't believe it, who said, we have to do these tests. It's impossible. That doesn't happen. Um, I was dealing with all of that. Now, how many of us um, get into the frame of mind where we can deal with doctors who say that and we still know that, no, I've got, um, I've got information from a higher authority than a doctor that this is my purpose and I'm not going to die. So there's a higher authority than the doctor. That is what healed me, the knowing that there was a higher authority than the doctor. So I truly believe two things. One is if, the, if we were more able to connect to who we really are by being ourselves and hearing that still small voice, um, you would see a lot more healings. And if there were less people in the way feeding that other voice that is putting all the doubts in you, they, they we would see more healings. You, you did did I say? Mm -hmm. you, you said something on our um, live event that really struck me, which was that cancer was the symptom, fear was the disease. And yes. what I see again and again in, in, in people I work with, in myself, is as the fear stops seeming so real, yes. as the fear goes, we're so well made that the body starts to put itself back together again. Our minds start to put themselves back together again. And it doesn't mean everything will be healed. These things break down, right? These, these have a shelf life. Yes, they but do. But it does mean that when you can get that out of the way as best you can, yeah. when the fear stops seeming so compelling, it, this already knows what to do. Yes. It doesn't need your help. It's like a little kid helping, you, you know, make stuff and actually they, they make a mess and you've got to clean up twice as much, but they get the pride of going, I helped. Yes. Right? That's us trying to heal. Exactly. It already knows it's got this. Yes. And, and the more we can find that place in ourselves and, 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 and sometimes it's as simple as giving up. It is. It's as simple as giving up, <laughs> surrendering, allowing. Yes. Yeah. It's exactly that. It's as simple as giving up and, um, and yeah, you've said it really eloquently and just getting that fear mind out of the way. And that's the challenge. And I think, and this is what I often tell people is that if there wasn't um, so much fear, we would see a hell of a lot more healings. I mean, um, I'm constantly dealing with people who come to me because they have the fear instilled in them by the medical paradigm. And that's why I truly feel the fear is the, is the disease. Cancer is just the symptom. Yeah. Uh, so thank you for reminding me that I said that. It's great, actually, that you remind me of some of the things I've said. I Very do often. I, and I, I think know it doesn't always seem like I do, but I do. Oh, no. It does always seem like. And, and what I love is the way you rephrase things and the way you turn many of the things that I say into tools. That's what's so helpful because usually I am just saying what comes to me. You know, when somebody is in front of me, I can always sense what they need to hear and I say what comes to me. But you have this knack for rephrasing it and then turning it into something they can use, like a tool that can be used. That's what I love about working with you. That's it's funny what I thing actually to say do. in response to praise, but I, I don't see it as tools. It, it, to me, it's simply when you see how something already works, you stop getting in the way of it and let it work the way it's designed. And yeah. so many of the problems we have at any level of life, because whether we're talking about the physical in terms of our bodies, we're talking about the psychological, we're talking about the material in terms of what we want to create in the world. The, the, the problem is we're working against the system unwittingly. Yes. And we see, when we see how the system already works, we, we, just, we do better. Yes. And you see, once you see how the system works, you can't unsee it. <clears throat> and that's what's interesting. But until you see how the system works, you're unwittingly going against the system because you're listening to all the fear-based voices, whether it's your own or other people's.
but that's what those are the tapes you're playing until you see how the system works. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I think we have another question. Danny's got his hand up. So here we go. Kiridwin Frigg says, so my question is, how does one help others find their purpose when you are on this path? All right. The first thing I want to say is, well done, Anita, for pronouncing that name, because I would have just backed right off that. So. <laughs> now, I might have completely got it wrong, and no, I, I do... I you did it, but you did it with confidence, and that was <laughs> lovely. <laughs> Thank you. And I do apologize um, if I did get your name wrong. I, I, you know, so I did pronounce it kind of phonetically. But and I guess that wasn't your question, is how do I pronounce my name? So <laughs> it, it, I'll, if it's okay, I'll have a little go, and then... I, and I would like that. So I'm not 100% sure that we all have a purpose. I think we have purpose in parts of our lives. We have a sense of purpose. You could say that the, the purpose of incarnating is to wake up to the truth of who we are. In fact, a lot of spiritual traditions do say that. So if being on purpose for you is something where, where it feels, there's a wonderful George Bernard Shaw quote I like, which this is the true joy in life, the being used for a purpose recognized by yourself as a mighty one. That sense of purpose is a wonderful thing, but it doesn't have to look like a purpose, right? Like, like sometimes the purpose is, is simply to enjoy your life. Sometimes the purpose might be to do your best to raise happy, healthy children. Like we, we get, I think, seduced. It's I, like, I don't know if, if you were into this stuff back in the stage when reincarnation was really like, I think it was the 80s, early 90s, where everybody was reincarnated. And, you know, the joke was nobody was reincarnated Bob, the slave guy on the left. Everybody was the reincarnation of Tutankhamun. And yep, Patrick, and Caesar. And, yeah. right? and, and it's, it, it's a bit like that. Not every purpose sounds cool, but your purpose will sound perfect to you. And you'll go, oh, yeah, there'll be a recognition rather than a ooh, necessarily. You'll just kind of go, oh, yeah, that is true. That does seem to be why I'm here. Once again, very eloquently said, because um, it, it aligns so so perfectly with what uh, with my answer to that question which is always your purpose is just to be yourself and if you don't know who you are your purpose is to discover yourself and what that actually looks like in the physical world as you're discovering yourself and being yourself what it actually looks like in the physical world may change as you are on this path and sometimes it will look like just being a parent of children or it will look like just um, spending time at home peacefully. It will look like different things at different phases of your life. But when you are on purpose, there is just this feeling of just um, uh, peace in being who you are and just a feeling of satisfaction and peace and contentment. That's what I was looking for. Contentment with who you are in this moment whatever that may look like from the outside in this moment. Yeah, and if, if I, I can, I just, as you were talking, it, it just reminded me, given the theme of this particular chat we're having and the sub-theme of our weekend is, is around a get out of jail free card for your life. One of the get out of jail free cards, and we have a lot of them, but one of the get out of jail free cards is realizing you're not your thoughts. Yeah. Because then it doesn't matter. You don't need better ones. That's not you. That's noise in head. And that's, you see that. Oh my goodness! You don't have to control this anymore. That's a that's a big one. I just got excited when you said that because I'm glad you said that, and um, because that's a big one. Because there is a whole culture of people that believe that um, that we have to control our thoughts. I was one of them until I died. Me too. Me <laughs> yeah, too. that I. Didn't. I I didn't even die, and I figured that out. Man, see, geez. I must remedial, have been really remedial. See, I must have been really dumb. I had to die to figure it out. 
Um, so, yeah, because a lot of people believe that because our thoughts control our reality, we have to control our thoughts. I mean, because our thoughts create our reality, we have to control our thoughts. And that's actually not exactly how it works. Because when you control your thoughts, you end up suppressing a part of who you are. And you end up fearing your thoughts and you're actually creating even more fear. And then when you fear your thoughts, you end up suppressing a part of who you I are. When I was into that, there was a book called You Can't Afford the Luxury of a Negative Thought. I was like, oh! <laughs> it's terrifying. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> oh, gosh. Yeah. So, so um, let's take one more question and then we're going to tell, tell everyone what the weekend event is about. And, and it's going to be like a, yeah, a whole bunch of different modules on, on this sort of thing about finding your own freedom in life. But we'll go to one more question if Danny has one. Ah, I'll let you pronounce this name. Oh, thanks. <laughs> let's see what we got here. Hang on, I've lost you for a sec. There you are. What about Karen? Karen, I can do that. We don't need to go for the last name. <laughs> uh, what about fear about finances and not having enough? Why is anxiety so widespread? I'm going to take that in two parts. Why is anxiety so widespread? Because we think it keeps us safe and we think it's normal. And so, of course, as long as it looks like, well, if I wasn't anxious, bad, even worse things would happen. So I'm going to give myself a little bit of pain now to prevent real pain in the future. It doesn't work that way, but culturally, everybody I've ever met has been taught that in some way, like a superstition, if I worry, it either helps me prepare or it helps me stay safe. It motivates me or it saves me. It's not true. It's not how we work. All anxiety does is it tightens the guitar strings and it makes everything a little more out of tune. Yes. That's that part. Specifically around money, the the thing that it's taken me years to see and and i'm going to say i i kind of see it i see it enough that i don't suffer from it in the way that i used to is that financial freedom does not come from your bank balance yeah. and the reason that we struggle is because we think i can't feel free around money i can't feel not anxious around money until i have more of it and so you can get better at creating more of it, and that's fun, but it won't fundamentally change it. And, and, and that was a bit of a revelation to me. And as I started to see that, as I started to both make more money and still feel anxious and work with people who were millionaires and even billionaires who, and the story that I often tell in one of my books in Supercoach, I talk about him as the, the $600 million man because his net worth was $600 million. And in one of our very first sessions, he said to me, every morning I wake up and think today's gonna to be the day when I lose it all. Wow. And I remember thinking, crap. I thought there was a number up until I met him. I thought there would be a certain threshold. If I could just get to that number, I wouldn't worry about money anymore. And, and I suddenly realized, oh, it's not a number. It's absolutely an understanding that leads to a state of mind. And that understanding is, is a recognition that your well-being, your security, your sense of self exists independent of circumstance, independent even of thought. And I have no idea if that sounds very practical to you or very esoteric to you, but it just is how it works, regardless of how it sounds. And I, I would concur. I would absolutely concur. It is, and, and I go back to that voice inside. It's whether that voice inside is telling you, you're safe, don't worry about it. Or, um, you know, and, and if that voice is on your side and it's telling you, take the job that, uh, that, that's following your calling as opposed to the one that you're just taking for the money to pay the bills. And it's whether the voice is on your side or the voice is against you. I remember having a conversation. Do you know, have you met Alan Cohen? I haven't met him, but I know exactly who he is. So I, I, I got to know him through Hay House and, and we, were, we were chatting once and I got offered exactly that. I had kind of two jobs, one of which paid really well, but was dodgy. 
Um, it was for some Eastern European mafia, and and <laughs> and another one that didn't pay so well, but was I, I I knew. But there was just Nina and I really could have used the money, and I remember saying to Alan, "Couldn't I just?" convince myself that it'll be okay this once and he was great because he really thought about it and he went no it's too late for you you know better <laughs> and, and that's the thing you know as long as you're not sure I wouldn't even worry about it but when you know you know and at that point it's a done deal yeah 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 because once you know you can't there's no turning back there's no you can't go back and and that's exactly how I feel like, I can't go back even to be the person I used to be before I had the near-death experience. And once you know, there's no turning back. So, so in fact, I just wanted to mention here that um, I get people writing to me a lot saying, when are you going to be in Los Angeles? When are you going to do an event in Los Angeles? So, this, if you're in Los Angeles, Michael and I are doing an event this weekend. It's a two-day event <clears throat> in Marina del Rey. And... Um, one of the reasons that I love, love, love doing event events with Michael is because we riff off of each other and then we actually create, um, I think we, we actually create, Michael doesn't call them tools, but, but we give you tangible stuff like take homes that you can apply to your life right away. That's, and, and Michael is particularly good at doing that, whether he takes the credit for it or not. He just has a knack for doing that. So, um, and, and for me, I'll add one thing, which is one of the things that I like besides I learn a lot just hanging out with Anita is that there's something about being in the experience of freedom, in the experience in our other events of God. That comes home with you too. In the same way as when Anita had her near-death experience, that has informed everything since. Being in that space of freedom as we come together will inform everything afterwards, whether you take away things that feel like tools or, or, or not. Um, and I noticed there was no uh, web address on there, so if it's okay, the, if people want to come along, either live or on the live stream, it's michaelneal.org forward slash freedom live. So michaelneilmyname.org forward slash freedom live. We're going to put the link on the, okay. on the post itself and under cool. the video. So, so it'll be there for people to click. And, um, <clears throat> and so what we try and do, and, and it's a very good point because it's not just about having the tools to take home, but we try and create, or what we, I think we actually managed to do it, is to create the space where you actually feel the shifts within you as we are speaking. So that's really what you mean about not needing the tools because the shift takes place as the event is unfolding. Yeah, and it wasn't like when Anita had her experience, when I've had some of the experiences that I talk about, they came with, okay, so from now on, what you do is when you feel like this, you do this. And when you feel like that, you do that. It, it's just that once you see how it really works at a deeper level, it, it makes no sense to go back and do it any other way. Exactly, exactly. So one of the things that happens <clears throat> is that our conversations do go really deep. They go really provocative. And, and the other thing is in private events, when we do private events, we do talk about things that we don't always talk about in public on, uh, on social media. We do go really deep. We do speak about provocative to topics. We do talk about things that maybe other teachers and speakers may not venture into. Um, we tend to go there and, uh, and we keep it real, like really real. And I also want to say that when we speak about God, we're not talking about some dude in the sky <clears throat> and we're not talking about religion. We are um, extremely ex exclusive. If you are religious, that's fine. We're totally fine with that, with um, whether people are religious or not religious. The one thing that I realized when I did die is that um, nobody gets out alive. So it's death is all inclusive and so is everything I do. It's all inclusive. You make it sound like Club Med. That's fantastic. <laughs> it is a bit like Club yeah, Med. Yeah, <laughs> so, so yeah, so if you're interested in finding out more, just click on the link and um, you get to join Michael and I on, on a weekend. And also, um, there is a live stream option, isn't there, Mike? 
there is. So, so one of the one of the things that uh, we've really developed as tech has gotten better is the live stream really is like being in the room. We can see you on a giant TV in the back, so we can actually talk to you. You can talk in the room, so you're not just like watching a movie. You're actually getting to participate, even if you're not able to be there physically. That's really cool. See, and that's uh, I think Lynn is the one that uh, sets all this up, or maybe it's your oh, team of people. Doctors under the bus. You're throwing Danny under the bus. I mean, yeah. I mean, I, sure. I mean, it is Lynn, but <laughs> I was going to credit Danny. I mean, you know. <laughs> I think yeah. Between Danny and Lynn, we've got it all covered. Yeah. We won't throw them under the bus. We need them. <laughs> They're driving the bus. <laughs> They're driving the bus exactly. <laughs> Yes. Yeah, so, so yeah. So we'd love to see you guys either live stream or there in person at the weekend. I always love the the feel of an actual face to face event. So, the energy is always great. So, any last words before we sign off, Michael? You know, only to say if you watched this and felt moments of quiet, moments of stillness, moments of oh, that's the direction we're trying to point you in. So if you don't understand a word we said, but you have that feeling, you're understanding everything that we're saying. And, and, and kind of the more you look to that, the less it'll be a question of which voice am I listening to? And the more actual just freedom you'll experience in your own life, which is kind of yeah. the point. Beautiful, beautiful. That's great. I think that you've summed it up. And I think on that note, um, we'll just say bye, but um, not goodbye. But I will see you all soon at some point on Facebook. And if you want to know more about Michael, whether you can join us this weekend or not, please check out his website. He is a great teacher. I, don't, I use that term loosely. He's a great speaker and he's just an all around great guy. Just someone I love to hang with. So thank you everyone for tuning in and I will see you all soon. Thanks and for having me, Anita. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. That was really fun as always. Bye. Bye. Thank you so much for tuning in to my video. And if you really enjoyed it, I would love for you to subscribe. And the subscribe button is here. And also I would love for you to watch my suggested video, which is over here. And if you love my content, please feel free to share it to people who you think that would benefit from it. Thank you.